Good morning everyone. Today's citizenship lesson is all about strikes, rebellions, revolts and revolutions. First we're going to have a quick quiz to see what knowledge is in your form room. So I'm going to read out a series of statements and you need to say after each one whether you think it is true or whether it is false and then you'll see on the next slide whether you were right or wrong. So you can just shout out true or false after each one. A strike is against the law. A strike is about securing a change to working conditions. A strike is intended to cause maximum disruption. A strike is about making employment issues more publicly visible. A strike is likely to lose you your job. A strike is about stopping work officially to increase bargaining power. Let's have a look which of those were true and which of those were false. So the false statements were a strike is against the law. That is not true. A strike is intended to cause maximum disruption. It might be a perception, but it's not true. And a strike is likely to lose you your job. That's not true. So the other three are true. Strikes are all about securing a change to working conditions, making employment issues more publicly visible and stopping work officially to increase bargaining power. So we'll have a look at what that means, stopping work officially on the next slide. So when we say stopping work officially, a strike isn't just a walkout. A strike has to be organised and it must follow rules in order to be lawful because otherwise employers can risk their jobs. It can be a situation in which you can get yourself in trouble. So in order to stop work officially, what happens is we have things called trade unions and trade unions are collective uh, groups that people join when they go into certain trades. So there are teaching unions, there are transport unions, um, all kinds of unions for various different trades. And what the trade unions do is they make sure that any strikes, any collective action at all, meets all legal requirements to protect their members. Generally, when it comes to a strike itself, it has to be voted for by members. This is why some teachers were on strike and others weren't, because some unions decided that they would uh, strike according to a vote by their members. Other unions didn't get enough votes from their members, so they didn't strike. So a strike is its very important. It has to be um, done officially in order for the people striking to be legally protected. A bit of etymology for you now, so the origin of words. A strike, the word comes from um, demonstrations that happened in 1768. And those demonstrations were by sailors in London in support of demonstrations that were happening in the city. And what they did was they struck or removed the top gallant sails of merchant ships at port. So those pink sails that you can see at the top, they were taken off, they were struck down chopped off, therefore crippling the ships, so the ships weren't able to go out to work and go out to sail. So that's where the word strike comes from. What we're going to do now is have a look at some famous strikes in the UK. And blanked out in blue is the result of these strikes. So I'll read you the information and then I want you to decide what you think the outcome was of these particular examples of strikes. So in 1926, there was what is called the general strikes. So this was huge. The people involved were transport and heavy industry workers. And more than 1.5 million workers went on strike in support of coal miners whose bosses wanted to reduce wages and conditions. In solidarity, people from other industries stayed off work. The Trades Union Congress called off the strike nine days later. So this was a, a massive strike in terms of it was about coal miners' conditions and wages, but people in other industries stayed off work in solidarity. What do you think the result was 
of the 1926 general strike. Have a discussion and then we'll see on the next slide what came of it. So the result was low pay and poor conditions remained. And in 1927, so a year later, the Trades Disputes Act banned sympathy strikes. So this was a bad result. The strike happened, 1.5 million people went on strike, nothing changed, low pay and poor conditions remained for coal miners, and there was a law put in place banning sympathy strikes. So no longer could you go on strike in solidarity with your fellow workers in different industries. In 1972, there was the UK miners strike, and this was the first time since 1926 that miners had gone on official strike. And the reason they'd gone on strike was because wage negotiations between the National Union of Mine Workers and the National Coal Board had collapsed. Um, they were asking for around a 40% pay rise. And this collapse in negotiations went on for quite a few years and it resulted eventually um, in a general election. But what also happened was a state of emergency was declared and a three day week was introduced. And this happened a couple of times and it was to, done in order to save electricity. So businesses were required to limit their electricity use to three days in the working week. At home, some of your um, people in your families, older generations might remember this, at home, people had to um, conserve energy after 10.30 at night. The TV stopped broadcasting. Um, it, it was like huge. The impact was massive. So on that basis, what do you think the result was of this strike? Have a little discussion and we'll see on the next page what the outcome was of the 1972 UK miners strike. The result of the 1972 miners' strike was that a pay offer was confirmed. So it worked to the degree that they didn't get the 40% or 43% that they asked for, but what they did get was a weekly raise of between four and six pounds a week, which does not seem like anything to us at this point. However, in the 70s, that was a fairly significant pay rise. And what it meant was that coal miners ended up being the highest paid of the working class industries, one of the highest paid, um, whereas before they'd been very poorly paid, but um, still very much a working class job. But in terms of wages, mining, there was a, a reasonable wage to secure for your family. And what it also did was it showed the nation how important coal was to our general operations. So very significant, the 1970s and coal mining. So our last strike is the 1979 winter of discontent. And again, older people in your family might remember this. This was a widespread strike by public sector workers and unions were demanding larger pay rises following government attempts to cap pay, so to put a limit on pay, in a bid to tackle inflation. The strikes led to a landslide victory for Margaret Thatcher's Conservative Party. So what do you think were the results of this widespread strike of public sector workers to get more pay? So this was quite a significant result in terms of the winter of discontent, because what happened as a result of this was that Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government promised and delivered legislation to restrict trades union powers. So the people 
in trades unions were restricted in terms of what they could do and what they could authorise and what they could um, support their members with. So this was quite major, the outcome of the winter of discontent. Trade unions are quite controversial. There's always been controversy over trade unions. Controversy meaning contra, which means against, and verter, which means to turn. So there's always kind of two sides to this. People disagree over trade unions and their place in society. If we have a look at the facts in terms of what unions have achieved, there are a number of things that you might not have been aware of. For example, two-day weekends did not used to be a thing until the 1930s when trade unions worked alongside industries to decide that Saturday and Sunday were going to be the weekend. Working hours, working conditions would be different. Also, there were limits on working hours that were put in place in the 1880s as a result of trade union um, lobbying and work. Um, I think previously the working week was 65 hours a week and it was limited down to around 50 in the 1880s. Minimum wage, I was affected by this, so in 1999 minimum wage was £3.20 an hour and I got that in my very first job when I took a year out before going to university. So trade unions were part of that achievement. Promoting parental leave in 1998. Um, not all businesses and organisations used to allow parental leave and annual leave um, used to be limited down to um, I think it was four weeks and then the amount of annual leave was increased in 2009 so trade unions have helped to make some significant changes to working conditions in the UK. Now let's have a look at rebellions and revolts. So strikes is one thing, an organised official stopping of work for the reasons outlined earlier. But a rebellion and a revolt, they're quite different. A rebellion comes from the word belair in Latin, which means to wage war. And this is where we get words like belligerent, um, bellicose, which you don't hear very often, but bellatrix as well. And bell, anything with bell or bellum in it is to do with fighting or war. And re means opposite or again or um, back in some cases. But in this case, it means opposite. So a rebellion is where you fight against something. A revolt is slightly different. This comes from the verb volver, which means to roll. And the re in this case means back. So if you revolve, it means you roll something back, you push something back. Um, the root uh, volve, volver, is in things like evolve, which means to roll out, involve, which means to roll together, and volva, interestingly, for the scientists among you, um, comes from the verb to roll. So what's the difference? A rebellion and a revolt are distinguished by their different aims. So rebellion generally seeks to evade and or gain concessions from an oppressive power. So it's about getting concessions. A revolt, however, seeks to overthrow and destroy that power, as well as its accompanying laws. So a rebellion, the goal of a rebellion is resistance, while a revolt seeks a revolution. It seeks to destroy and overthrow a power. So on that basis, where do you think a strike fits in all of this? So on the scale between a rebellion, resistance, and revolt, revolution, where do you think a strike might fit? And you can use, if, if it's easier, one or two of the examples that we've looked at today. Is a strike a rebellion? Is it a revolution? Or is it neither? Your final question for today is, you may have seen in the news last week, Gary Lineker um, made a statement on his personal Twitter account about his opinion on the government's policy with refugees seeking asylum in the UK via small boats. And as a result of that, the BBC declared that Gary Lineker wasn't entitled to make statements on his account and that the BBC can't be associated with 
um, opinions anyone working for them needs to be careful etc etc and what happened was there was a, a situation on Saturday whereby match of the day was on with no commentators there were no pundits in the studio and it was just football just being played on the TV like you were watching it live with no people speaking at us and then there were changes to radio shows there were changes to the football um, productions on Sunday so what I want you to think about and decide in your groups is Gary Lineker's colleagues like Ian Wright and Alan Shearer and people on the radio like Alex Scott his colleagues refusing to work in solidarity with Gary Lineker would you call that a strike would you call it a revolt or would you call it a rebellion what do you think you can discuss that and have a nice rest of the day thank you for listening <laughs>